Junior year of high school, my parents got a job offer out of state, so I was forced to move all the way across the country. I started a new school late into the academic year, about mid-March sometime. Because of this, I was having a hard time fitting into the new school. All I wanted was to make a single friend, but I was too shy to talk to much of anyone. This was around the time that my friends left MySpace to join Facebook, so I did the same to keep close to them. Some days later, I received a friend request from David. David was a guy that I had been friends with in my old town. Well, he wasn't exactly a friend, rather a friend of another friend of another friend. My friend Jerry had introduced him to the group and would bring him along every time all of us would hang out together. I knew that David was a year older than us, and he had gone to a different school as well. Other than that, though, none of us really knew a single thing about him. In fact, we always just kind of referred to him as Jerry's friend because he never even bothered to talk to any of us. Obviously, when I received a friend request from him on Facebook, I was more than a little bit confused. He had hardly ever spoken a single word to me when I lived near him. So, for him to want to be friends with me after all of this time seemed a little bit strange. I was really lonely though, and desperate for friends, so I didn't really care. Other than not really being sociable, nothing had really ever seemed off about him, at least not at the time. Looking back, I remember that looking through his profile, he seemed to hardly have any pictures or friends when I accepted his request. Like I said though, this was around the time that people had just started using Facebook, so it didn't seem all that weird for him to have such a barren profile. Over the years, his friend list got a lot bigger, even more so than mine, so I didn't really think anything of it. Anyway, I digress. I accepted his request. It was like this that David and I became friends. He told me he had just started university, and he was quite lonely, because he was also too shy to make friends in person. I sympathized with him that I was having a hard time in my school as well for the exact same reasons, and we started to bond over that. Little by little, we started to talk more and more. He shared his problems with me, and I shared mine with him. When it was time for me to apply to university, he even helped me out. He taught me how to sign up for my SATs and ACTs, and helped me to apply to scholarships. He even paid for one of my application fees, using a Visa gift card so I didn't receive any of his personal information. Then, when I started university, he helped me out with that as well. He told me where to buy books, gave me studying tips, provided emotional support. So when he asked for my phone number, I didn't hesitate for a second to give it to him. David was now one of my best friends, and I wanted to keep him close, even if physically we were far away from each other. It was around this time that he began to share more of his life with me. All of it was pretty normal stuff. He had a job at Pizza Hut, which he hated, but needed to keep in order to pay his bills. He also played soccer, but not for a university or anything, just a group of guys that got together on the weekends to unwind a bit. I think the biggest reveal was that he'd flunked out of university, and that I was the only one that knew because he was too embarrassed to tell anyone else. He also said at one point that he had to move back in with his mom, which he seemed to hate a lot. Two, maybe three years into our friendship, my family decided to take a trip back to the city where we had lived, prior to moving across the country. I excitedly told him and all of my old friends. Most of them were excited about the idea of us all hanging out together again, because after high school we'd all gone our different ways. When I contacted David though, he showed very little interest. In fact, he seemed quite opposed to the idea. I thought this was weird. You know, I wasn't just some stranger he had met online, but rather someone who had been close to him for many years now. I kept insisting and asking for a reason, and then he finally gave me one. He told me his pictures had been heavily edited, and he was afraid of disappointing me if we were to meet in real life. I told him it didn't matter what he looked like. I just wanted to meet him and hang out in person for the first time in a long time but he still refused to do so. Instead, he started being a massive asshole to me. He knew exactly what buttons to push, all my insecurities and secrets. He started using that knowledge to hurt me badly, so I stopped talking to him for a while. Some weeks later, I met up with my friends as planned, and much to my surprise, I saw David there, looking exactly like he did in all of those pictures. I didn't understand why he'd lied about photoshopping them, 
or why he said he didn't want to meet me, only for him to show up at our friend's house. I was so angry at him that I didn't ask any questions. I kept waiting for an apology, but he refused to approach me. He was treating me like he'd treated me back when we were in high school. I was getting really upset, but given that he was being such an asshole to me, I figured this was another attempt at getting under my skin. We were all drinking and talking about what we were up to, and when it was his time to share, he pretty much said all the same things I already knew about him. That he wished he was still in university like the rest of us, but he'd flunked out and was living with his mom. Said he was miserable there, and he wanted to move out, but his job at Pizza Hut wasn't paying enough for him to do that. At this point, I was pretty pissed off. The alcohol had given me enough courage to finally ask him why he'd been treating me so badly. He apologized and admitted he barely remembered me. Well, obviously that hurt my feelings badly. I told him about Facebook, about the mean text messages. He just kept insisting he didn't even have a Facebook. Uh, apparently he used to have a MySpace at some point, but stopped using that when he switched over to Tumblr. A Facebook account was something he'd never even considered making. I asked him about the messages, and he said I'd probably confused him with another David. In fact, he never had my number in the first place. I thought denying it was a lousy excuse, but then Jerry backed him up. The thing was, apparently David hadn't just been talking to me on Facebook, but a bunch of us. So when we kept calling him out on this shit, he told us to text this David guy and he would prove it was not him. He set his phone down on the table and I sent him a message. But no matter how long we waited, no new message appeared on his phone. While we were all arguing about how we needed to give it some time, the David I had been talking to for years responded, proving that we had been talking to a fake all along. Things turned pretty awkward at this point. They were all confused, and David was obviously feeling very violated. With all of us wanting answers, we opened our friend's laptop and searched up that profile on Facebook. The first thing David pointed out is that whoever this person was, they were using his mother's maiden name, not his real last name, and that while most of the people on his friends list were people that he knew in real life, none of them were people he'd actually kept in contact with. His profile picture was a dog he owned years ago, but had long since died. All measures that, looking back, I'm guessing were used by this person to keep David's actual friends from finding him on Facebook. The older pictures had all been copy-pasted from his MySpace, but most of the newer ones had been copied from his Tumblr, which he apparently uploaded to pretty often. The weirdest thing was, as he continued to scroll through this and point out the fakeness to us, he noticed some pictures he swore he'd never even seen before. Pictures from his soccer games taken from the audience view, which the fake David had insisted his brother had taken. The real David said his brother never went to a single one of them, nor did any of his family members or friends. Further exploring his own fake profile, David pointed out that while a bunch of his status updates were things that never happened, a lot of them were actually quite accurate, and things he'd never shared with anybody. Whoever this person was, they'd been watching David for a long time. They knew his schedules, they knew what movies he went to, what ice cream flavors he liked, even his favorite bands. Whoever this was knew every single thing about him. We tried to confront this imposter, but they never answered the messages after, and instead the profile was deleted before we had the chance to examine any further. We never did get any answers. I don't know why that person pretended to be David for so long, or why they did it in the first place at all. All I know is I felt extremely violated for having shared so many private details of my life with him. I also felt extremely bad for the real David. I wondered for the longest time how this person found him and how they managed to learn every private detail of his life. A few months back, my mother called me up, saying she'd found a profile with her name, but with my pictures on it. She thought I'd made a second profile. I didn't tell her the truth because I didn't want to scare her, but the truth is, I hadn't even known it existed. I'd always set my Facebook to private, and I no longer accept random friend requests, nor do I post my pictures anywhere else. This profile only seemed to have old pictures of me, from the time when I'd actually been friends with that David's profile account. 
There wasn't weird stuff like David's soccer game pictures or anything like that, but the account was still active, and it had been for a while. None of the friends were people I actually knew, and the updates were all things that I'd told that fake David I'd been doing in real life. I don't know if the profile belonged to the same person exactly, but I'm extremely average looking, so I don't know why anyone would want to use my pictures when there are way prettier girls online to pretend to be. I'm guessing that it had to be him. I don't know, I just reported the profile, and it now no longer exists. Sometimes, I wonder if that person is still pretending to be me, or if they've moved on to pretending to be someone else. I live in a small suburb and nothing too crazy happens there. I lived in a small complex that was almost like a gated community, minus the gate. It was fairly safe and even when I would walk the 10 to 15 minutes home from my friend's house at 12 a.m., I had never been in too much of a panic. It was just a quiet suburb, nothing more, nothing less. I got a job in my junior year of high school about three years ago. It was working at a local pizzeria that was about a block or so away from my house. My shift would end at around 11 p.m., and I would walk home soon after. We were along one of the busiest roads in town, and it was always lined with cars from the houses on the street. One night, I was walking, when from inside one of the cars, I heard a loud knock on the window. I didn't see any light inside, but I could see what I thought was the shape of someone hiding in there. I ran home in less than two minutes after. I was pretty spooked out, but I let it pass me by because, again, nothing bad ever happened in my town. The very next night, though, I heard a loud knock on my front door, which soon turned into banging. Then, someone began ringing the bell incessantly for 15 minutes straight. A few weeks before, a similar thing had happened. It was just one of my neighbor's guests who'd gotten the wrong house and thought they'd locked her out. I thought perhaps it might be a similar case, but when I peeked out, I could only see the silhouette of a large man I didn't know at the door. My grandma and I called the cops, but by the time they got there, he was already long gone. My best friend walked me to school every day after that, and eventually I began to feel safe again. No incident occurred for about six months after. One day after school, though, I was walking home. There's a large cul-de-sac a block over from my house, and a man drove up to one end of it and started calling out to me. The man looked vaguely familiar. I couldn't remember where I'd seen him before, perhaps a co-worker or something. We were nearby my job, so I thought it might be a new driver. I'd waved at my boss from the window on my walk home, so maybe my boss had said to catch up with me so he could introduce himself or something. The guy was in his mid-thirties, Hispanic-looking, and his name was George. He was fairly attractive, drove a clean car, and looked somewhat presentable. He said I was beautiful and asked if I wanted to hop in for a ride so he could take me out. I declined and he asked if he could have my number then. I mistakenly gave him my name, but I did not tell him my number, only that I was 16 years old. He apologized and drove off. I figured that would be the end of it, because I was surely underage. Another six months passed by. It was winter once again, and I was bringing a package to the post office. After school, I took the 15-minute walk in the snow at 3 p.m. It's still bright out, and people were now coming home from work. The kids were also walking home, so there were a lot of people around. I crossed the big intersection which marked the halfway point from my house to the main street with the post office when I hear someone call out my name. I turn and see George at the light. I started walking faster. He sped into a different street to turn around and be at the smaller street I was crossing. Hey, need a ride? As I ran faster to the main road with the post office, he tried to stop me in his car three more times. I finally made it onto the main road and ran to the office. George parked right next to me and said, Hey baby, why won't you talk to me? I noticed he was about to get out of the car, so I screamed for him to leave me the fuck alone or I'd call the cops. He looked scared, said sorry, and I ran into the post office to cry. I regretted not calling the cops in that moment, but from what I know now, I don't think they would have cared much. 
Eventually, I started to get rides to go from my job to my house, even though it was only a block away. I would only go to the post office if I really had to as well. I basically ran home every day after school because I was terrified. Things started to calm down and I began to forget about him again, until about five months ago. My best friend was walking home around 10pm, about a 20 minute walk. She'd made this walk before both alone and with me and had no issues. As she passed the large intersection that marks the halfway point, she noticed a car. Something felt weird about this, but she tried to brush it off. It sped right past her. She eventually reached the pizzeria, and a car parked next to it rolled down its window and asked if she wanted to hop in for a ride. She said no and walked further to get to her house, which was another five minutes away. He kept stopping and yelling for her to get in. By the time she reached her apartment, she looked out the window and saw him still parked outside. It took an hour for him to leave. She texted me this and I asked about his description. I realized right away it was George. We did call the cops to tell them, giving the best description we could, but they basically just laughed it off. It's just him thinking you're pretty, just don't get in the car. I posted something on Facebook warning everyone about this guy, as a lot of my high school friends lived nearby as well. A girl private messaged me freaking out, saying he'd followed her home multiple times. Another girl messaged me as well, and told me she used to work at the local bar. He would stay outside hiding and waiting for her, until one day he managed to follow her all the way home. Then he started to bang on her door repeatedly, and parked outside her house every night for a couple of weeks. The cops, of course, never did anything, as they said he wasn't breaking in or threatening her. I've since moved, but it feels like he's everywhere somehow. I wonder if he's ever done anything worse. I wonder what it would take for the cops to take him seriously. When I was about 9 or 10, I was invited to a classmate's birthday party at some swimming baths. All of us were the same age. It was a small class of about 20 kids or so, and I was pretty sure everyone had been invited. Just to clarify as well, I'm a boy. Anyway, I got kind of separated from everyone else, and now it was just me and this one girl all alone. I wasn't particularly close friends with her or anything, but I did know her, as she was in my class. To describe the location we were in, it was like a tunnel that connected the main wave pool to a lazy river. There wasn't really anyone else around, just me and her in complete silence, when suddenly, out of nowhere, she lunged at me without any warning. She grabbed my head and shoved me underwater. I was a pretty skinny kid, and she was much bigger than me also a bit of a tomboy, so she was stronger as well. About 20 seconds went by as she held my head underwater. I furiously tried to free myself, but she would not let go. Fight or flight and mass panic began to take over, and eventually I somehow managed to force my way free. I was coughing and spitting out water as I emerged. I remember just looking at her in complete shock. I think I just began to ask why she did that when she grabbed me again and shoved my head even deeper under the water. It felt like a lifetime before I fought my way free once again. Both times I genuinely thought she was going to drown me. She didn't even try to let me up. I had to fight my way free. I didn't know how to swim at this time, but the water in the lazy river and the tunnel was only about chest high. I began to rapidly backpedal away from her. She was giggling and laughing, as if it was the funniest thing in the world. She had this crazed look in her eye and a grin on her face. I couldn't climb out to escape, as it was a tunnel, so I had to try my best to get out of there. As I was backpedaling, she was following me. I made sure to keep a distance, so she couldn't lunge at me again. She was slowly gaining on me, though. I tried to reason with her. I was so scared of her that I was just babbling nonsense. I tried to distract her by suggesting we go down the water slide together. I think it actually worked somehow. I could see her thinking it over, and she stopped trying to chase me. I managed to exit the tunnel and the water, and she slowly followed me. She seemed to be a bit unsure now. I felt a lot more safe, as I was now out of the water and could see other people around as we headed toward the slides. 
I kept talking all the way about how fun the slides were, but she didn't really speak at all. She had this strange look on her face the entire time. After we went down the slides, I caught up with my friends and stuck with them the rest of the time. I was extremely shaken up. I never did tell them about it, as it was embarrassing to admit a girl had just tried to drown me twice, and I was worried about getting teased. Anyway, fast forward to adulthood. This girl turned out to be a lesbian, I guess. Not that there's anything wrong with that. What is wrong, though, is that she got with a partner who had two or three kids from a previous relationship with a man. Turns out they would torture the kids and eventually killed one of them. She's currently serving life in prison. I told my friends about the swimming pool incident after hearing about her crimes. I'm pretty sure they think I'm just bullshitting them as none of them took me very seriously. Maybe I was being a bit lighthearted about it as I joked I was almost victim number one. Nonetheless, though, it's a bit crazy to think back on, as she obviously was a genuine psychopath. If I'd never fought her off to escape and then convinced her to go down that slide with me, I genuinely believe she would have killed me in that tunnel. This might be a little bit long, but it still gives me nightmares. I'm a 21-year-old female. I drive from Miami to Daytona Beach near Orlando almost every other week or so. I make sure to fuel up before I start off, but this one day, this one unfortunate day, I forgot. I left Daytona around 12 a.m., driving back to Miami. I drive a black Mustang 40th anniversary, and I was literally flooring it back home through I-95. The entire route was pretty much empty, other than a few trucks and small cars here and there. I was jamming to some good music, not paying much attention to what was going on with my fuel tank. At around 2.30 or 2.45 though, the low fuel warning popped up. I saw it and started looking for the nearest exit, which happened to be Boynton Beach. I'd never been there before, and I had no idea, and still don't really, about what the area is like. I took the exit and saw a Circle K just off the exit. I was a little bit relieved, because now at least I wouldn't run out of fuel in a place I'd never been to before. With barely enough fuel to spare in my car, I pulled up to this gas station. It was totally empty. I didn't even see a single car inside or outside the road. There were no other people other than a single tall man wearing a red-colored jacket. He was walking around near the side of the gas station store where all the parkings were. He wasn't very close to the pump I was at. I was a little bit unnerved, but I tried to shake off my fear by telling myself it was nothing. The man at this point was only looking at the ground, but I could see he was kind of walking in the general direction of my car. I was still inside contemplating whether I should get out or stay inside. Usually I would have just gotten out and fueled up, not being scared at all, but something in my gut was telling me to lock the door right now and wait inside until either the man went away or walked past my car. At this point, the guy was only a few feet away, still not even looking at me. I tried to tell myself, it's okay, he doesn't even care that I'm here, I should just get out and do it. Then though, my worst fear came to life. The man looked straight up at me and dashed toward the driver's side door. He tried his hardest to yank it open. At this point, it was around 3 a.m., with no other people in the general vicinity. I froze for a moment and thought I was going to die. He pulled on the door handle desperately, trying to force it open. Somehow, I got my senses back. I turned my car back on and floored it. He was holding on so hard, he didn't even let go of the door handle until I hit the gas pedal. I'm thankful my low-fuel car still started and drove off. I had nothing to defend myself with, other than a plastic fork I'd gotten from Panda Express earlier that day. I still can't get over the whole experience. It scares the living crap out of me. <laughs> 